I think this is the most important year for Bitcoin that has ever existed. Mm. We are probably days away from a series of ETFs being approved. And so this is the moment for Bitcoin to, to use that old term, cross the chasm and really see mainstream adoption where our parents and our grandparents understand what it is, can buy it, and then do buy it. And I think that if all of this comes to pass, Bitcoin will be a part of the traditional financial lexicon by the end of 2024. So that is my most anticipated trend of the year. Shamath Palahapidia, a highly successful entrepreneur and investor, has achieved billionaire status through his early involvement with Facebook and notable investments in companies like Slack, Virgin Galactic, the Golden State Warriors, and Bitcoin. In a recent podcast, Chamath revealed his belief that the most significant trend of 2024 will be Bitcoin. Having been introduced to Bitcoin in 2012 by friends, he, at one point, claimed to collectively own 5% of the total Bitcoin supply, with an average by price close to $100. In the podcast episode, Chamath discusses why he considers 2024 to be a pivotal year for Bitcoin, marking its true mainstream adoption. Despite his forefront position in technology and artificial intelligence innovation, he emphasizes Bitcoin as the standout trend for the coming year. The video explores the reasons behind Kamatha's early conviction in Bitcoin, featuring a clip from 2012, and delves into his bullish outlook. Chamath not only highlights the relevance of his 2012 reasoning but also explains in the conclusion why he anticipates Bitcoin reaching $100,000 before eventually hitting $1 million in the next two decades. That's why I'm a huge fan of Bitcoin. I mean, yeah. I'm very, very long Bitcoin. Um, people ask me, you know, on Twitter, I got into a long conversation with a guy over the weekend and, uh, you know, he asked me what my favorite Bitcoin companies were and I said, none. I said, you know, right now you just want to own the underlying commodity. Like Google didn't choose to be in the USD, you know, US dollar business. Google is a business that's amazing that just happens to get paid in US dollars. Yeah. Similarly, I'd rather own Bitcoin than try to find the onesie twosie guy at the edges right now. Now, over the long history of time, there will need to be on ramps, on ramps and off ramps and companies will be successful. But in the short term, owning that currency and allowing water to find its level, particularly in the developing markets, is huge. And if you don't think that this thing is going to rip when Brazil goes through a devaluation, when the Indian rupee continues to get crushed, when you have all of this money trying to get in and out of these countries where there's massive you know, political instability or monetary or financial instability, you're being naive. It doesn't matter what happens in the United States. It doesn't matter what happens in Japan. It doesn't happen, matter what happens in the EU. It doesn't matter. It matters what happens in Argentina, in Venezuela, in Kenya, in Brazil, in India, in Russia, in yep. China. And when you look at where all the activity is, it's in all of those markets. Yep. This will be born out of a people's desire to have unfettered access to capital. Yep. So again, yep. on that sociological theme, that's another area which has. Oh, look yeah. at what the Nazis did during World War II. It's disgusting. You know, if you have ways to protect and hide your wealth, your hard earned money, you know, I mean, it's, this, I think it's a really profound, important thing. And so you're, hold on, just so, we, just so we know we can feel bad about ourselves, you're accumulating it at what price? Uh, well, my dollar cost average is around 100 and something. And, and you've held it, everything you've bought? Well, at one point, myself and, you know, two, so I was introduced to it by a person. I asked him if I could disclose his name. He said no. But he, myself, and another person, all three of us relatively well-known in the Valley, we went and we started, at one point, we owned almost 5% of the entire float. <laughs> In 2013, uh, we've sold, they've sold, et cetera, et cetera. I wish we had kept it all. We didn't. Uh, it's fine. Um, but then I wrote an article, and I said, you know what? There's so much asymmetric upside here. This is a thing that either goes to, you know, at the time I said, roughly the value of gold. And at the time, it was about $100 a coin. And so there's very little downside. There's all this asymmetric upside. I said, take 1% of your net worth and buy this schmuck insurance. And it's a schmuck insurance in this kind of very elegant, beautiful I way. Missed that was I missed it. I missed the schmuck insurance. That was at a hundred dollars, though. What would you, I mean? I, I I actually started hearing from people that I know very well who, who don't often invest, who are now asking me if this is the time to, to invest. buy the schmuck insurance now. Here's uh, here's the thing. This is now a confidence game, right? There is no real utility in this. This is a fantastic fundamental hedge and store of value against autocratic regimes and banking infrastructure that we know is corrosive to how the world needs to work properly. 
you cannot have central banks infinitely printing currency. You cannot have folks with you know, misguided and misdirected monetary and fiscal well, policy. We've done, you, you done okay. It, you just called it a confidence game, which is yeah, right. a con and, game. And we've done okay. The, it's a con the economy's game. built on central banks and built on, on fiat currencies. Where you, you said yourself how much better life is in, in every respect than it's ever been. And that's with that as no. a so, infrastructure. So, so we've seen the first few chapters of this. And now we have to go through this great unwind. Right, when all this liquidity now, what, what happens? We'll see what when, happens. We'll right. see what happens. And so all I'm saying is to have the ability to hedge that out right. in a way that isn't fundamentally correlated to the people and the infrastructure right. that made those decisions that we were not a part of fundamentally, I think is a smart but thing. But the point is if you haven't jumped on this bus or train or whatever uh, so, vehicle you want to describe it as, has it left the station? No. Um, so here's what I would say. The same way that I said in 2013, put 1% of your net worth into Bitcoin, I will put myself out there today. I think this thing is a $100,000 a coin probably in the next three to four years. And I think it is in the next 20 years, a million dollars a coin. So there you have it. You're, you're telling people to put 1% one of, one of your net worth. At the time. That's, that's for, <laughs> now that's it's a for, lot harder. But right. that, that's for people who have money to play with. I mean, if you're talking to an average retail investor who's looking at this, somebody who's trying to figure out, should I put it in my 401k or should I put it in Bitcoin, you would tell them what? Well, I don't think that's the actual trade-off. In your 401k, so for example, in your IRA... But, you Chimoth, can, I'm, I'm saying that there are people who have to make decisions about these things who aren't fully invested in their 401k. So what I'm saying is I own a lot of Bitcoin in my IRA. It is possible. So I did take a small percentage and I put it in there. All I'm saying is there's a small God percentage bless him of to everyone's do it in the most tax-advantaged way. Absolutely. But you have money to play with. No, but I, what I'm saying is you could buy the S&P 500 index, buy 99% of that. So if you have $100 to invest, what I'm saying is... Put $1. Put $1. And, and the reason that $1 is so valuable is that it is fundamentally not correlated to the other 99. And just on the off chance that all the people that manage the 99 may not totally know what they're doing, the $1 may actually save us all. Chamath Palahapitiya's vision for Bitcoin, as discussed, reflects a clear understanding rooted in both ambition and a profound grasp of market trends and technological advancements. From his early days as an investor to the present, Chamath consistently views Bitcoin not merely as a digital asset but as a transformative force in the realms of finance and technology. His predictions and beliefs regarding the cryptocurrency's potential are deeply grounded in years of experience and success in the tech and investment sectors. Kamatha's insights are noteworthy, emphasizing the transformative nature of Bitcoin. He sees it as more than a speculative investment, viewing it as a significant player shaping the future of finance and technology. However, as with any investment, it is crucial for individuals to conduct their own research and evaluate their financial situation before engaging in the dynamic world of cryptocurrencies. Kamatha's perspective, while influential, should be considered alongside individual circumstances and risk tolerance. In conclusion, Chamath Palahapitiya's stance on Bitcoin highlights its potential to be a disruptive force. His belief in the cryptocurrency's transformative capabilities underscores the need for investors to carefully consider their own financial circumstances and conduct thorough research before entering the cryptocurrency market. Kamatha's insights, grounded in years of experience, provide valuable perspectives on Bitcoin's role in shaping the future landscape of finance and technology. For more Daily Dose Crypto News, check out these two awesome videos on your screen. Click now and we will see you on the next video.